first uh, ever interview for um, Past Conversations. Delighted uh, that we're starting off today with, with Taff Gillingham. Taff is someone who I've known on Twitter now for, for several years, and this is actually our first ever, um, albeit kind of digital virtual exchange, but uh, great to finally speak face to face. So thank you very much, Taff. It's a, it's a pleasure to speak to you. Um, Taff's someone whose reputation precedes him. Um, he is uh, well known for his knowledge and expertise of all things military history, particularly we'll find out, but I think from what I know, specialise in sort of 19th and uh, 20th century. Um, and attention to detail, I think is something that Taff is going to be talking about today. But, but Taff, certainly you, you introduce yourself and say hello. Yes, well, uh, yeah, well, I'm hugely honoured to be the uh, the first guest uh, of uh, of many illustrious guests. So uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, my name's Taff Gillingham. I'm a military historian, a non-academic military historian, who um, who at school didn't think I'd be doing anything at all to do with history as a day job. Um, but as uh, as these things often work out, uh, ended up with a really really interesting career based on on military history. So uh, um, and hopefully over the the, the next. Uh, 15, 20 minutes or so, I'll tell you all about it. Interesting there that you mentioned your time at school. Um, perhaps, you, did you have any memories of, of, of history at school, of kind of studying history uh, when you were younger? I absolutely loved history at school. Um, so right, right from the beginning, I mean, I was, I suppose in a way I was quite lucky having been born in 1966. So it wasn't that long after the war. So at that time we were still surrounded by veterans, uh, pretty much of both world wars. A lot of the people, a lot of the school teachers were people who'd fought in the second world war. And um, I mean, my grandfather had fought in the first. So we were sort of surrounded by it. And, um, but, uh, but specifically at school, um, I'd, I'd always had an interest in history right up until the time where uh, where we had to make our choices i think in the third year at secondary school we had to decide what we wanted to do and it was a bit of a toss-up between history and geography because um whilst i was interested in history what i really wanted to study were the two world wars so i can remember going to the uh, to the head of history and saying if i pick history will we get to do the the two world wars and he said adamantly no 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 it won't be the two world wars we're going to do something completely different this time so i said okay in that case uh, thank you very much i'm going to go off and do geography which i did thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, and got no level in geography but annoyingly of course they went on to study the two world wars um so that that was actually where my academic study of history finished um Afterwards, when it came to uh, to doing A levels, uh, I did have the chance to do it again. But um, but by that time, my my interest that what I wanted to do for a day job was was much more design related. My my I was sort of very creative. My background, I suppose, really uh, was film and television design. That's what I ended up doing to begin with. So I went off down this sort of arty route. Um, I did do A level history um at night school if you like in the evenings um but in the end the work was just uh you know just, there was just too much work going on and i didn't get to finish it which was a shame because we were doing the uh, imperial russia uh, with a teacher who was utterly brilliant and it was fascinating but there just wasn't the time to do it um and since then um obviously over the years you know i've you know got a reputation for, for 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 having quite a lot of knowledge i mean i'm like a sponge really i'm very lucky that whatever information i get goes in and stays in and uh people ask me something and from somewhere it just comes out again which is uh, which i appreciate is quite fortunate um but i can remember professor pete simpkins who um was the um senior historian at the imperial war museum before he retired uh, and pete lived in ipswich and i used to take him to the western front association meetings every month because pete didn't drive and uh, a couple of times he said you know you, you know why, why don't you do a degree in military history you know it'd be uh, you know it'd be relatively easy thing for you to do and i and i said well the thing is pete you know by this time we you know i would I was regularly being interviewed on television, um, you know, sort of first war subjects, uh, all sorts of television programs and series. And I said, the thing is, Pete, actually, um, when they come to interview us, you know, it's 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 Professor Peter Simkins. In, in those days, it was Dr. Gary Sheffield. And then there's the bloke at the end. And what it kind of meant was that if you study enough, if you get enough knowledge, if you amass enough knowledge and you really do become an expert in your own field, then, you know, then it shows it gives hope to other people that if you've got something worth saying and you know what you're talking about then people will listen to you and i actually personally i think that's a very important thing and a very powerful thing and i hear all the arguments i mean there are people all the time saying oh history historians should be regulated you shouldn't be allowed to use the term historian yeah. unless you, you you've been approved by someone but but 
it's far too vast a subject and history is far too important to be left to historians alone and it's it, it's for everybody. Everybody gets the opportunity. There's all sorts of fantastic history being studied and, and being learnt and being written by people who, who have other day jobs, who do other things, you know, and, and I think there, there is room for everybody. Um, I think it only becomes a problem when people who have no idea what they're talking about um, get themselves into roles uh, where, they, uh, where, where they give advice, historical advice, uh, when it's very clear that they don't actually know what they're talking about. But, but those people are the exceptions rather than the rule. If you love history, if you're passionate about history go on and do it just uh, you know stick with it it's well worth it Taff anyone who knows you you know it's it's clear that history is a, a genuine genuine passion um, it's something that's just kind of intrinsic to you and intrinsic to your life and it's part of who you are so um, what why history why to you is history so important that's a really good question I mean uh, I think that um, I think that sometimes you know it's very easy to, uh, to to get completely wrapped up in this stuff and think that history is really important to everybody, and on a daily basis to most people it just isn't. It's uh, it's something that's fascinating to those of us who are really interested in it, and we know how exciting it can be. We can we we just that that absolute joy of knowing that there's there's this massive jigsaw puzzle most of the pieces are missing but every now and again you can just put in a couple of those pieces and see a bit more of the bigger picture uh, and it's just magic and uh, and sometimes you sort of think well why on earth wouldn't everybody be interested in this but but in a way thank goodness they're not you know uh, because it'd be much more difficult for us to get the resources and uh, and find out the information if everybody was fighting over the same stuff um but i think that um I mean, I suppose the, the, the true answer is that it, in a way, it almost doesn't matter because, you know, throughout history, we can see how history changes, how it alters, how views change, how opinions change. Um, I mean, the thing that, that really got me started, the thing that really made a difference was all of those years with the khaki chums in the early days, in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, we, where we would get talking to First World War veterans. And what was fascinating was that, I could have a conversation with a First World War veteran two days in a row. And if I was wearing my civilian clothes one day, and if I was wearing a First World War uniform the next, they would tell you completely different things. They would almost sort of, um, they would almost buy into the, you know, the, the whole sort of uniform thing, uh, almost as if, oh, you know, well, it's all right, I can tell you this because you'll understand. Um, and what became obvious very, very quickly, that a lot of what I'd learned at school about the First World War was clearly, at, at totally at odds with what the veterans were telling me they had a totally different version of the first world war to the one that i'd learned and because i suppose in truth in in, in the 70s and 1980s it was very common for the first world war really the only contact with the first world war in school was uh, was very rarely through history it was nearly always through english literature so it, it, it was hi history via poetry really so it always gave a very very slanted view and and it fascinated me, it absolutely fascinated me that these veterans who, who were clearly very proud of what they'd achieved, um, they, they were in no doubt whatsoever that they'd achieved something great, that the, that the victory of 1918 was something that they were hugely proud to be part of. They always had that sort of, um, when you got chatting to them, they always seemed quite disappointed that most of the British public didn't understand what they'd done and didn't get their achievement, uh, but were always far too, uh, far too reticent to make a fuss about it. And that to me, was was a real catalyst because I thought well if what I learned isn't the truth of the first world war then I need to start digging around and finding out what is and I think that that's been the absolute magic of the whole journey is that so many things that you think are set in stone clearly aren't um, and a lot of the things because people make assumptions History teachers make assumptions. Uh, I'm sure you don't. Anyway, you do. We all do. Um, academic historians make assumptions. All, all sorts of people make assumptions. Um, and so we use those assumptions to fill in little bits of knowledge where we think it doesn't matter. We don't need to research that because oh, they'll be the same as us. Um, give me a for instance. If uh, what would you think? You know, a First World War soldier in a trench system would it be? Would he prefer a day where it's a bit cold, a bit blustery, might be a little bit wet at times, or a day where it's absolutely blazing hot and sunny. Now, virtually every bone in your body is screaming at you saying, well, of course you want a sunny day. And no doubt, you know, they would all say when the sun came up in the morning, we always smiled because it was great to see the sun. 
But what they would always say as well was that actually, if it was cold and a bit damp and a bit windy, you could move about and warm yourself up. If it was a blazing hot sunny day, you had to wear in, in the front line and the support line, you had to wear your full uniform. You wore all the equipment, you wore your helmet all of the time. You couldn't take it off. So it just sapped your strength. So whereas we would say, oh, clearly it would be better to be a hot sunny day. Well, actually, it's counterintuitive. And so much is counterintuitive about the First World War and, and, and other wars, you know, and all sorts of history in general. And I think that. That's the fascinating thing about it, that it's very easy to accept what we read, to accept what our minds are telling us, what our brain tells us, but challenge it all of the time, turn it upside down, you know, think, well, actually, why? Why would they do that? Why do they do something that, that is, at the first glance, seems a really, really stupid thing to do? Because I can tell you now, they weren't stupid people. The people in charge weren't stupid people. All of this stuff, I mean, you know, shelves and shelves full of books original books of the time the manuals everything worked out a lot of detail and of course it was a learning process of course it was a slow learning process there were going to be a lot of pitfalls along the way but some of the brightest brains in the empire were working out the best way to achieve victory so if something that you read you think well that's a ridiculous thing to do then don't just accept that it was a ridiculous thing to do say why did they do that and as the starting point is they weren't stupid, therefore, why did they do that? And that to me has been, uh, it's been one of the, the, the most pleasant parts of the whole journey is that, uh, is really finding out that those veterans that we met all those years ago, you know, and, uh, and, and their take on the First World War was the right one, of, of course, and why wouldn't it be? Um, and, and, and it vindicated uh, so much of what they said. Uh, and, the, and the discovery, the, the learning process and, and the working things out, a lot of which um, my particular journey has been through handling the artifacts, learning the drills, handling the weapons, firing the weapons makes such a difference to actually get the chance to do all of that and I've been very lucky over the years with so many projects that uh, you know there's there's probably not a, a, a British army small arm or you know rifles pistols machine guns of, of certainly of the first half of the 20th century that I've not got to fire on a firing range somewhere and and, and have an understanding of uh, because it's one thing carting it across France and Belgium and Holland uh, on a khaki chums tour but very different thing to actually have the thing on the range and feel how it kicks and uh, and you obviously you get a, a very different respect for it when it's not just an, an inanimate object so like I say, my journey in a way has been uh, has been very different to <laughs> to most people who who, who find themselves studying history uh, and find themselves working in in, in this field. But um, but I think that's the thing. I think to me that's that's been the important thing to me. And the thing that drove the khaki chums in the end, the thing that drives khaki devil, was a a, a real passion and a, and a and an enthusiasm for making sure that we try and represent those fellas and women properly. Yeah. now that they can no longer speak for themselves. You, you speak about your, your, your career in terms of, you know, whether being academic or, or non-academic and, um, and this whole idea about being a historian and whether you, you know, you, do you need that kind of rigorous academic training or can you just amass a certain amount of knowledge for your own passion and enthusiasm for a subject? Now, you've certainly got to where you are because of your knowledge, you're well known for it, you're respected for it, and you're highly regarded. Um, but you've done that through a non-academic route, which you, you, you mentioned yourself. So, so what's, what's, what's worked for you? How have you got to, to where you are today? <laughs> uh, that's a really good question and, and not a straightforward answer. Um, I suppose in a way I was very lucky um, growing up um, as with so many people in the late 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, we were surrounded by people who'd fought in both world wars. Uh, the culture was around you everywhere. There were teachers at school who, who'd, be, who'd been Spitfire pilots and, uh, and, and who'd been tank commanders in Italy and things like that. Um, I'd had relatives who, who'd been in you know, Japanese prison camps and, uh, and, and my grandfather had fought in the First World War. So, um, so you were surrounded by it. So straight away, there was always an interest. Um, that was uh, that was certainly encouraged by the sort of toys we played with. We had uh, dear old Action Man. There were um, obviously model soldiers. We we made model aeroplanes. Um, so 
the, the whole culture got you interested in it right from the start. Um, at school, most of my friends shared the same interest. There were a few weirdos who were interested in football for some strange reason, but the majority of us had that interest. A lot of them had got uh, collections of bits and pieces that, uh, I don't know, German medals that granddad had brought home from the war or a, uh, or a, a flying helmet that had belonged to another relative, um, or they'd got their dad's collection of bits of shrapnel they'd picked up from the street during an air raid. So all of that sort of stuff, um, made me interested and throughout my life as, as gradually as I got older I got interested in other things as well I got interested in old cars and all sorts of stuff as I, as I grew up but that interest never went away um, and one thing I think that made a real difference to me uh, was was starting to collect things properly I can remember uh, even though I would got a lot of sort of little bits and pieces that I'd sort of picked up at school and swapped and traded um, I can remember going into a into uh, the Ipswich Collector's Centre one Saturday lunchtime with my friend Michael Field when I was 11 and um, and they, they they sold coins and stamps and postcards and and, 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 and bits and pieces of military mm -hmm. and I can remember buying a, a Second World War British steel helmet for £1.25p and that kind of changed everything because suddenly he was history that you could pick up you could hold it you could wear it you could feel the weight of it you could understand it and I think since that time I think that's been a really important thing to me uh, I mean whatever it is you know um you know I, I always have to study it look at it experience or something like you know you put it on immediately you feel the weight of it immediately your movements change everything alters the moment that you pick this stuff up and put it on uh, and, and you make a connection with it you know you have an understanding so, you know over a century ago a German soldier was fighting wearing this very steel helmet and another soldier a British soldier picked it up off the battlefield and brought it home with him so I think that connection certainly sparked an interest that never ever went away um, by the time I got to my late teens um, I'd got I'd already amassed quite a collection of it and in my early 20s, I met up with a bunch of other guys who were all collectors, authors, experts of all sorts of aspects of, of, of British military history, all sorts of stuff from weapons to, to period packaging and ammunition crates and goodness knows what else. And we became a, a, an organisation called, called the Association for Military Remembrance, alias the Khaki Chums. And the Chums weren't a reenactment group. They weren't really a living history group. It was a study group. And what we would do several times a year, we would go off to France, Belgium, Holland, and we would live the part for a week, 10 days, something like that. Not for public display, not, you know, there's really any public about, but it was so we could understand it, so we could learn all about it. Um, and it was, it was the whole lot. It was the underwear, it was the shaving kit. You couldn't take anything modern with you. I mean, even to, as far as was possible, the food would have, you know, was as close as we could get to how it had been at the time. And, um, so so years later when when you read um personal accounts by soldiers are there people like john lucy or, or um um or, or frank richards they talk about marching down the road their feet stinging on the cobblestones the clank of the mess tins the smell of the wet serge uniforms most people have to imagine that now but i don't i can smell it i can taste it i can feel it because we've literally done that for real. And people said, oh yeah, but you know, you've got no idea about the sort of fighting end of it. But I mean, again, we were very lucky. We met a lot of old soldiers, a lot of First War veterans and, and, and Second War veterans. And we got to listen to them, we got to hear their stories. And the First War veterans, time and time again, would say to us, you know, 80% of the time, we were bored stiff. 19% of the time, we were frozen stiff. 1% of the time, we were scared stiff. So what that actually means is that 99% of that experience you can get some understanding of in some form or other. 1% you don't want to, you don't need to, you know, that's, uh, you know, there, there are accounts that they've written that, uh, that, that tell you that stuff. But it was a, it, it, it was a direct way of engaging with the past. Um, you know, some people would, uh, you know, th 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 there are some very good ar archaeologists who do the same thing, you know, this sort of experiencing it, learning from it. Um, you know, it it's a very, very good way to understand things. I mean, I know I've got some great historian friends, uh, you know, some very good academic historian friends who very often misunderstand quotations because, the, the, you know, the, the, the something that's written on the page is, is very, very different to, to, to picking something up or, or the description of something or how something was worn or where it was worn. Um, and very often the manuals of the time say something's worn in a certain way but every single photograph you look at it's not worn like that at all 
And when you wear it, you go, well, duh, because it's really uncomfortable. So clearly everybody's decided that they're not going to wear it how the manual says, they're going to wear it how it's comfortable. So that, I mean, the best part of 30 years, um, the khaki chums were, were doing their thing, uh, sort of learning, uh, sharing that experience. We would teach, uh, you know, we would go and lecture in schools, we'd lecture for universities, we'd go and talk to the army, you know, very often we'd go and do lectures for the army. Um, and what that led on to was giving historical advice for film, television and theatre work, because as we reached the stage where the veterans had, had faded away, there were hardly any of them left, and certainly the last few really had nothing more that you could learn from them in, in real terms. Uh, they'd got the same sort of few stories, but you could no longer go to them and really sort of squeeze them for, for the sort of the detail that, that, that you'd need. Um, we, we sort of provided a surrogate for that, um, because... If a, if a film producer or director says to me, well, how did the fellas do this? Why did they, why did they do that? I could tell them, I, well, they do that because of this, because we've done it effectively for real. And so that led on to um, quite an interesting sort of secondary career because I'd, 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 you know, I'd, I'd sort of produced and directed uh, sort of corporate film productions, things like that. I'd, I'd run an audio visual design studio for BT and goodness knows what else. But... I'd always had this, this great interest and this great passion in military history and uh, found myself by the, uh, by the late 1990s being asked to provide historical advice for film, TV and theatre work. And my mantra was always, you know, that, 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 I mean, historical advisors can be a real pain on, on a film production because some people think that the role is simply to tell the director why he can't make the film he wants to make. Whereas my take on it is it's much more about saying, look, well, this is what you need to do uh, to, make, to create the story. But actually, you really can't do it how it's been written in the script because it makes no sense. And you're, all that's going to happen is you're going to get criticised. So actually, instead of doing that, how about you do it like that and get the same effect? I mean, for instance, um, many years ago, we worked on a production called All the King's Men, which was loosely based on the story of the fifth Norfolks, who, who a lot of them killed and disappeared at Gallipoli. And... Um, and in the end scene, they'd got Captain Beck, who was played by David Jason, surrendering to the Turks. And he, and he just throws his revolver on the ground and puts his hands up. I said, he'd never do that. That's shamefully casting away your arms in the face of the enemy. Oh, oh well, that's what the script says. I said, well, what he would do, he would turn it around. He would offer the pistol to the Turks, hilt first. Oh, fantastic. So that's how they shoot it. So it's no use just saying, well, here's a problem and walking away. You need to be able to say, well, here's a problem with your script. But actually, if you do this, you can get around it and make sense of it. So, and... And also it's, it's knowing what you're talking about, because very often um, the, 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 over the years I've bumped into all sorts of productions, uh, you know, which we've been helping with, uh, provide some kit for where, you know, where the advice is just nonsense. It just makes no sense at all. You know, and I, I'm a great believer. If somebody asks me to advise on something that I don't know about, if it's not my period, I just say, no, no, that's, that's not my thing. You need to talk to somebody else who is an expert on that particular thing rather than just take it on because it's a job. Um, I mean, Kev Smith and I set up a company called Khaki Devil back in 2001, um, specifically for a BBC series called The Trench, which was, um, it was probably, probably the only piece of real reality television I think anyone's ever made. And what I mean by that is that we took 25 fellas from Hull and with a whole load of my fellas as well, about 50 of us at any one time were trained as First World War soldiers and then had to live in a trench system in France uh, for, for, for about a month. And we followed the war diary of the 10th East Yorks, the, the first Hull Pals. And so the BBC's job was to create situations that that particular battalion were in every day, but nobody working on it could know what was going on. So everybody had to react in real time. So if the BBC had set up an effect that had cost tens of thousands of pounds, and they missed it, they didn't film it, then tough luck, you couldn't do it again. So for instance, if there were German aeroplanes came swooping over one day, uh, which is what it says happened in the war diary, if they missed it, if they didn't get it, they couldn't just say, oh, stop, can we just do that again? Because those aircraft had flown over in real time and then gone again. So um, it was a fascinating production to work on. And they'd taken me on as a historical advisor, and um, which was quite interesting in its own right. I, I went to a meeting at BBC Bristol and, um, and the... Uh, Dick Coltis, the producer, sort of said to me, so, uh, you know, we've done all these other sort of projects in the past, uh, surviving the, the Iron Age, uh, the Time Watch thing about the Roman army, to a lesser extent, the, uh, the, uh, the 1940s house or the Victorian house, whichever one it was. He said, and all of those have failed in some form or other, you know, um, but, you know, 
what are you going to do to stop this this one being a failure so so <laughs> that was quite an interesting introduction to uh, you know to to, to 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 the project and so pretty much they let me just get on with it they let me decide how it was going to work uh, and they just filmed it as i say in real time in sort of documentary fashion and off the back of that at the end of that meeting i just said where are you going to get the gear and they said oh we'll hire it i said well well you can't there's nowhere that you could go and just hire i don't know 30 odd sets of this stuff that's going to be like new that uh, that the fellas can live with for a month and just on a whim i said if you're interested um my mate and i'll set up, set up a co company and provide all of the gear if you want we're not going to do bits of it we'll either do all of it or none of it and uh and at the end the deal is that we'll have it all back for free and uh and a couple of weeks later they sort of said well get on with it then so that's really how we started khaki devil which um which then has sort of gone on to uh to provide uniforms equipment weapons and props for all sorts of really fascinating uh, military history projects uh all around the world and um and it's been a fascinating journey One other thing that I feel you've got a lot of pride in and you're certainly very proud of is the, the Great War Huts project. Um, maybe you could tell us a bit more about that and what's involved. Certainly. Um, every time um, we've been involved in a major First World War piece of drama, um, we've got a trench system on the outskirts of Ipswich that we use. So uh, you know, people like Downton Abbey or uh, the film of Private Peaceful or the recent uh, Journey's End adaptation, they come to us and spend a few weeks filming all their sort of battle scenes, combat scenes in the trenches. And every time we've had a, a high profile project like that, we've been inundated with people saying, oh, can I come and have a look? Can I bring the Women's Institute? Can I bring the school? Can I bring the kids? Can I just come and have a look? And you can't because we don't have planning permission for public visits and if you did you wouldn't see a first world war trench system you'd see a film set because whereas a, a first world war trench system is full of right angles to limit blast damage what we've done is we've opened all of those angles out to give you better sight lines for cameras for film and television work so you would just come and see a film set which would be interesting but you're not really going to learn anything so that got us thinking um, about 10 years ago that what we should do is try and find somewhere where we could buy a site specifically to build a proper First World War Visitor Centre um, where people could come and learn properly. And so we, we spent several years looking before we finally found a site at Horsted near Bury St Edmunds, um, which was four and a half acres with enough room for a car park. Uh, there was enough room for us to, you know, there was an existing farm building that we could put the uniform and equipment hire business in. There's a lovely old Victorian barn that we could use as the sort of reception area and put a cafe on the back and some toilets. Um, there was then a little sort of flat plateau area with enough room for 11 replica First World War Army huts. And beyond that, there was plenty of room to build trenches. The whole thing had a little river running through it. It sat in a, in a river valley, um, so well off the beaten track. Um, no power lines, uh, because even though nobody thinks they've been transported back in time 100 years, if there's a modern power line sitting on the horizon, keep poking you in the eye every few minutes, it does rather spoil the, spoil the effect. So we bought it. Uh, we eventually got planning permission to build this site, as I say, with 11 replica First War Army huts to put displays in, for a big one to have as a lecture theatre, exhibition space. Um, and no sooner had we got planning permission than we started to find original First World War army huts. And so the whole project kind of stalled and slipped sideways into a heritage project where we are now rescuing and restoring 11 original First World War army huts of all sorts of different types, um, which we're traveling around the country, taking them down, bringing them back to Suffolk, restoring them and putting them back up again. So by the time we're finished, we, we'll have that big recreation hut for concerts, exhibitions, lectures. Um, that's already up. We've got a guard room. Um, there'll be one proper barrack hut, a proper 20 foot by 60 foot barrack hut with the 32 bed spaces. Uh, they didn't have proper beds. They were just little short, low wooden trestles with three planks laid on them. And during the day, that would all be stacked to one side to give them room to get around the table and have the grub. Um, and there will be six huts which tell the story of the First World War um, chronologically, but not in a kind of dry, dusty, oh, and then there was another battle, oh, and then there was another one, then there was another one after that. that, that that'll kind of be buried there in the background, but it's much more artifact driven. It's much more about telling the stories, using the things, using the stuff, um, and, and looking for stuff that people relate to. 
um, you know, I wear glasses. A lot of, lot of you will wear glasses. And there's a sort of an assumption that, well, well the army wouldn't wanted us because, uh, because we wear glasses. But one of the exhibits we have is an original army optician set from the army spectacle depot. And when we researched that, we discovered that throughout the period of the first war, the army spectacle depot made something like 400,000 pairs of glasses during that time, which is quite extraordinary. Well, clearly that wasn't a service for civilians. So then you start looking for the pictures and there they all are. Hundreds and hundreds of pictures of infantry soldiers all wearing glasses. I then think, okay, well, it'd be good to have some you know some some stories to back that up so i, I asked richard van emden the uh, the, the author a uh, great friend of mine i said richard have you got any stories about fellows with glasses in the army he said, oh yeah yeah he said got this great tale of two fellows that go out with an officer into no man's land on a listening patrol and they've been out i don't know half hour or so total silence they're right up by the german wire listening to what's going on suddenly they get spotted and all hell breaks loose and there's bullets and explosions and flares going up and they come dashing across no man's land they jump into the trench and the sergeant major says where is he where's who where's the officer oh, blimey right back out into no man's land they go around halfway across there's the officer on his hands and knees because he's dropped his glasses and he can't see he's trying to find his glasses they have to pick him up and carry him back so straight away we've got uh, we've got the artifact we've got the pictures we've got the stories all of which help tell that story and all of which make it clear actually yeah yeah that would have been us that would have been those of us with glasses and so that's what we're looking for we're looking for ways to draw people in to tell those stories and um, of course it all needs to be based around real history um with the intention is not to simplify stuff uh, to to you know to make sure that uh, that everything's um that, that everything's backed up with sound with sound history um and it's a it's a real legacy project it's um that's the intention that by the time we all go that there will be something specifically about the first world war left behind us yeah. um which will help tell those tales of all of those old soldiers we met and many more who as i say are no longer around to speak for themselves <laughs>